I'm going to initiate release sequencer. On my mark. Five. We're on express elevator to hell. Going down. Two. One. Mark. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark, a.k.a. Derringer. Today is Sunday, August 18th, and you are listening to episode 222 of the Instant Action Podcast, your weekly source for planetside news and information. As always, I'm brought to you by great listeners like you via the Support the Show tab on instantactionpodcast.com. So how is everyone doing this week? I don't know if you guys follow everything that I talk about on Reddit, but uh, I was very excited this past week for finishing up my Planetside 2 mouse pad collection. For those of you long-time listeners know, when I went to SOE Live, I bought a bunch of merchandise at SOE Live. I mean, everybody does when they go to things like that. Uh, but I didn't buy as much Planet Side 2 merchandise as I wanted to. And more than anything, it's because I was flying cross country because uh, SOE Live was in Vegas and obviously I live in Massachusetts. So seeing as how I was flying cross, cross country, I packed as lightly as humanly possible. Uh, I was traveling with one of those rolling duffel bags. So it's a matter of getting as much clothes and stuff that you can get in there as humanly possible with it still being a carry-on item. So that's that's exactly what I was doing when I went there. So uh, I bought, I believe if I remember correctly, I bought the Vanu mouse pad and I think I bought the new conglomerate mouse pad as well. And a couple other, you know, different trinkets, Planetside 2 related trinkets that uh, adorn my walls and stuff like that. Uh, but I've all, I'd always been kicking myself for not picking up that Terran Republic mouse pad to complete the set. Granted, I don't play TR as much as I play the other two factions, but uh, I'm kind of a completionist for anybody who knows me, so having everything of something is kind of big. Um, I mean, when I do, I do a lot of Kickstarters, a lot of board game Kickstarters specifically, uh, and I'm one of those people that has to have everything for that Kickstarter, so... Uh, not having a TR mouse pad kind of irked me for a while. Well, uh, I got lucky and saw someone selling one on eBay and, you know, new in box and I picked it up and now I have all three and I'm happy. Uh, they don't have an NSO one. Maybe the guys at Daybreak Games should think about making an NSO one now that uh, NSO is being uh, made so much bigger. Uh, then I'd have to buy that one too, along with a bunch of other people, I'm sure. Uh, it... it it kind of leads me to advertising, which is something that I'm going to talk about later on this week's show, but just wanted to share my excitement on finishing my mouse pad collection, which I know is trivial for most of you. Uh, but enough about me. What's in store for this week's show? Well, first, there was a small PC hotfix to go over. And when I say small, I mean really small. Uh, then I want to talk about RHEL's recent development letter, followed by the August 15th PTS update, which immediately dropped some of the things he talked about. Then I want to finish this week talking about that aforementioned return of advertising and my thoughts regarding it. Plus, I have some listener email to talk about. So strap in as we hot drop into another episode of the Instant Action Podcast. So first up this week, like I said, was that August 14th PC hotfix. And this is all stuff that's on live. It was, like I said, completely the smallest hotfix that we've gotten in a long time. Uh, it was all bug fix related. First, they fixed the EMP flashback effects that were bothering people. They also fixed some of the smoke grenade and other particle opaqueness. Uh, they gave another pass on it from their graphics engineers because of all the complaints uh, regarding smoke grenades. They also fixed generators so that they will no longer instantly revive after being destroyed. And finally, they pushed out another speculative fix for viewing outfit applications which were causing crashes for certain players in the game. Again, that's it. Four bullet points, a tiny little hot fix. Uh, if I recall correctly, they had said there was going to be downtime for it, and it turned out that there was no downtime for it. Uh, this stuff all just went to live pretty quickly and pretty painlessly. Um, with such a small hotfix, I'm not surprised that that's exactly what happened, that 
there was very little pain or very little downtime regarding it. I would hope that a lot of stuff like this gets pushed out pretty quickly and pretty easily with little to no downtime. And I'm sure most players don't even know that some of this stuff is out there. Um, but I think that if you play enough, you understand that EMP, smoke grenades, the generator one, those were big issues within the game itself. So uh, I'm glad that they dedicated an entire hotfix to just fixing those three things, which in addition to many players were some of my main complaints uh, going on in the game right now. But with that, let's move on to a much more exciting topic. And that topic is the recent development letter titled Honing the New Player Experience that was put out this past week from RHEL. And I'm not going to lie, when I read it at first, I thought it was a developer letter coming from Nick. And then when I got to the bottom and realized that it was uh, from RHEL instead, uh, I was kind of curious and it, it it's not what I expected. Like I said, I I thought it was a developer letter, not a development letter. Uh, and again, when I didn't see Nick's name at the end of it, I was kind of taken aback and had to go back and reread it and realize that this is stuff coming from RHEL and, uh, and not from the developer itself. Uh, regardless, I, honestly, that doesn't really make too much of a difference one way or another, who wrote it or who put it out, uh, except when you think about where it's actually coming from. And reading it through, it really felt to me like this was something in Rel's own words. So uh, I don't know how true that is or if this was a group effort to get this, this information out to us. But without further ado, let's actually talk about this rather than me keep rambling on. So it starts off how they talk about how they've been focused heavily on performance and stability post DirectX. 11 update on PC and how they were gearing for the big now released new soldier update on the PS4. Uh, and now that those huge initiatives that they had going are complete, they can actually start talking about what is coming next for planet side Two development. And he says that towards the end of the summer, they're going to begin making a serious commitment towards bettering the new player experience. And the reason being is that they have a lot of new players coming to the game now. Uh, and, long time people like you and I or not you I shouldn't say you and I because I know some new players listen to this as well uh, but a long time player like me kind of understands how brutal this game can sometimes be for a brand new player logging in for the first time so what they've been working on is a more satisfying first experience to make those people excited to come back and stick around long enough so that they could potentially be a veteran like a lot of this, a lot of us that are playing. Now, their first step uh, is going to be with more mentors. So as we know, they just recently released the mentor system, which I have not participated in the mentor system. And really, I haven't participated just because I don't usually lead squads. Um, sure, I could log in at any time and lead some squads if I wanted to and work on my mentor rating. Um, I'm just not a squad leader. I, I, I like to talk about the game. I don't like to direct people in the game. Uh, even though outside of this, outside of the game, I like to consider myself a leader in, in real life because I like to direct people and tell people what to do and see the results come from it. So maybe I should try to lead more in Planet Side 2, but... Regardless, they're happy with the mentor system that it is right now, but they're going to be adding more mentors in the future. And they said they're going to be doing this by flagging trusted community members to speak in the new player channel without actually requiring a mentor rating. And they're also considering reducing the requirements to speak in this channel overall. Uh, of course, when I read this, my, read this, my ego got the better of me, and I said, oh, I'll be one of the first people that they choose. But should I really be one of the first people they choose to speak in this channel? I, I don't really know. I will leave that to the community to say if I'm somebody who should speak in the channel or not. Now, granted, when I'm online playing, uh, I do try to answer questions in Yell Chat when they come up, uh, and whenever I'm actually just doing stuff with players, uh, you know, playing in squads or whatever and people ask questions related to the game i do consider myself sort of someone who knows what the hell's going on and because i do the show that i talk about a lot of this stuff so maybe i'm 
a little more dialed in on the changes that are coming out from one way or another. But again, it is not my choice whether I get granted member mentor player channel access or not. That's up to Daybreak Games and the community and stuff like that. Would it be a huge honor if I got that? Yes, I'm not going to lie. Uh, any little perk in game uh, because I'm somebody who helps the community is something that I would never say no to. But enough about more mentors. They're also going to be modernizing the death camera. And in all honesty, the death camera uh, and cameras in general have some is something that I've been clamoring for for the longest time and uh, this is going way back to the community clash days for those of you who don't even know what community clash is this was something that uh, uh, a bunch of us tried to put together to have competitive games uh, within planet side 2 and it wasn't good that's just the only way that I can put it and I felt that it wasn't good because the cameras for casters and things like that were not up to the standards that I would have expected them. So the fact that they're thinking about modernizing the death camera is a good thing. And it's going to be similar to things seen in other types of games. So before everybody starts screaming that, oh my God, the death camera is going to ruin stealth and it's going to give away my position, then I'm going to get killed so much easier. This is in so many other games right now, and I don't think that it affects all these other games. Uh, in fact, uh, someone I follow on Twitter and is someone I couldn't agree with more on this topic, that would be Lex. Uh, you know him as at Milsim Prodigy. He writes, the amount of idiotic shit I'm reading about the proposed death cam for PS2, LOL, quote unquote, flanking it is irrelevant now. And he says, bro, are you stupid? Have you ever heard of a motion spotter? Do you think no flanking happened in, say, games like, oh, Battlefield 4, which had has the same camera, uh, you know, that's that's his entire tweet. I, I couldn't agree with what he said more than anybody else uh, who's talking about the proposed death cam. So, again, before anybody gets crazy over a death camera ruining the game, it's not going to ruin the game. And Rel goes on to say that soon we'll be seeing a revision of the death screen on the PTS and eventually live, which they say is a more modern style death camera that offers a brief look at your killer before panning back to your corpse. Uh, he says they've heard compelling reasons both for and against features like this in the past, and ultimately they feel that there are pronounced benefits for all players when it comes to learning base layouts and easing the frustration of quick or unexpected deaths. Uh, on top of that, they feel that the new camera uh, is more in line with the pacing they see from modern modern day Planet Side Two. Now, uh, uh, quite a few people actually went to the PTS immediately because this is on PTS, which I'll talk about in the next topic. Uh, the death camera is out there right now if you want to go test it out and play around with it and see what it does. And basically, if the person who killed you is still in range, uh, in a render range, it will render where they are highlighted in red. Um, it's great if you're killed by a sniper and have no idea where they were. Uh, it's great if a vehicle killed you and you weren't expecting it. Uh, it's cool if somebody peeks a corner and kills you and goes back out. Uh, you know, it's stuff like that. Uh, if it's, if you're killed by somebody with mines who le leave mines out and then disappear out of render range, you're not going to see where that person is. So it's really only going to be affecting people in an existing fight with you more than anything else. And this is not a terrible thing for new players, uh, coming into the game, not knowing where they got killed from learning stuff and getting to be a better player. It, it is not going to break planet side two. Uh, and again, I think Lex's tweet pretty much summed all that up. Uh, moving on from the death camera though, Rel wrote that they're also going to be having better loading screens. And by that, they mean they're currently working on them and making them more contextual. So for new players, an example, you might see a screen with gameplay, with gameplay elements like, how a generator overload works, whereas a veteran player could see the ones that are currently in the game right now. Uh, it would also make this system that they're looking to push out would also make holiday and event driven loading screen easier to swap in and out as well. Uh, I like this because again, everybody makes fun of the new player tips on loading screens for veterans. They're tips that we've seen since 2012 at this point. So not having those for veteran players is not something I'm going to cry about. And if it allows them to 
push out more information to new players and not clog up my screen. I'm all for that. Moving on, he ta next talks about tutorial modes, and they're currently working on modular tutorials where new players can dive into the specifics of different classes and elements of gameplay, like capturing bases. Uh, he, they, he says that while they feel the community will continue to be the best resource for new player guidance, uh, they want to have structures in place that allow players to take a step back from the shark tank and learn at their own pace. Uh, and these modules will replace the introductory tutorial available that's on PC right now. Then he goes to move on and talk about Sanctuary, because there's been a lot of talk about Sanctuary. Uh, and this was back in the July live stream, so last month they showed off an early development version of Sanctuary. And he says that it was met with confusion uh, and the greater vision for why it was even seeing development wasn't made clear to the community. And he says while it's not time to reveal what their long-term goals are for the zone, he can offer some context for its initial impl implementation. Uh, they want it to be the first real social hub in Planetside 2. And when they say social hub, they're talking about a place where players of all sides can interact outside the war effort and access features that don't belong in a combat zone. And for that initial implementation, they're going to target the re release of time-limited vendors of exotic and rare gameplay rewards, also some lore of elements, also an all-faction voice, and also an all-faction text chat. Ideally, their tutorial modes would follow, would be coupled with the initial release of this zone, but there's no guarantee that that will actually happen. He does say, though, that Having this social hub gives us a better holding area for players waiting in queue, lets them build out lore elements, and also creates a necessary foundation for long-term gameplay elements we're looking to introduce next year and beyond. Uh, I'm curious what some of those long-term gameplay elements are. Uh, and the email that I'm going to discuss a little bit later talks about some of this that I think as well. Finally, the next thing that he talks about in this post is the mandate system. Uh, and this, he says, is the biggest system that they're currently working on currently. And I'm going to put less of my spin on this and more of his exact words regarding this. So mandates will be time-limited challenges with concrete objectives and rewards given upon completion. For the first implementation, they're looking to create a system that can generate daily, weekly, and seasonal challenges like the directive system, but more robust and forgiving, as well as create and trigger mandates via script. Uh, they'll be using mandates not only as a daily motivator, but also to incentivize, incentivize participate. Oh my God, just choked all over those two words. Incentivize participation when a contact switch happens in game. So the example he gives is after an aerial anomaly event fires off, you now have the time-limited goal of destroying enemy aircraft, delivering anomaly data, or supporting allied aircraft. And if you don't do all those, th those things, you don't get the, the actual reward. So the mandate system should help make rewards feel more punchy and immediately obvious. It gives players a clear, complete goal to finish, and it allows them to be more generous rewards while maintaining tighter control over our currency economies. Uh, like much of what we're working towards now, this system will support the long-term development of the game itself. He goes on to say that beyond the first implementation, they're looking to create communal mandates where multiple players can contribute to the completion of the same goal. For example, an entire faction could be working towards a seasonal mandate, uh, and be trying to complete it before other factions do. Or you can have an outfit have a mandate that elevates the entire outfit as a whole upon completion. Um, those are pretty cool when you actually think about them. There's a lot of outfits in the game that are looking for things to do. Uh, and having a mandate that tells you to do something before other outfits in the game, uh, it, it could benefit larger outfits, I don't know, but having some things dedicated directly to outfits is is 
better than nothing as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he finishes up by saying that this isn't all that they're currently working on. OSHA's still in development. NSO weapons and vehicles are on the way. They're still doing bug fixing. They're still doing balance adjustments, etc. But what they mentioned above is their main focus heading into the fall. Uh, he finishes by saying the reality of game development entertains that these features may be changed, pushed back, or dropped altogether. But we feel confident that everything on this list is worthy of our time and attention and will help propel the game forward for years to come. So that's just the boilerplate saying if one of these doesn't work, you're not going to see it. Uh, so there was Rel's lead designer um, letter. Uh, for lack of a better term, uh, th there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Uh, and I think I talked about the majority of it on the way. Uh, the death camera, I'm really big on. Uh, sanctuary, I'm willing to see what's coming out of it. Uh, but the mandate system really has me peaked about, or has my interest peaked about what might be coming next for Planet Side 2. But with that, let's move on to our third topic this week, which actually has a little more meat regarding some of this. So that PTS update dropped on August 15th, and first it started by tweaking the aerial anomalies. Uh, the resource rate when depositing to a data buoy f went from 50 per second to 20 per second, uh, and this ensures players have more time to kill targets with larger Tempest capacity. Uh, the galaxy resource capacity was halved to 500. Liberator was reduced by 100 down to 400, and the Valkyrie was also halved to 250, and they are still working on a fix to an issue where vehicles are sometimes unable to acquire or deposit Tempest. And we're still waiting to see when the next Aerial Anomaly PTS is coming. Uh, next is automated bounties have made their way to PTS. And I know a lot of players have been sad that they haven't been able to do bounties, especially during the double XP week. Uh, that just ended, and I will agree, I'm one of those people who misses placing all of my bounties during double XP. Uh, but the new bounty system that's made it to PTS works as follows. Uh, bounties are going to be automatically placed on characters who have an active 10 kill streak or greater, and that there will be a long cooldown between how often this can occur. When a target gets automatically bountied, they'll re receive five stacks immediately, Kills on a bountied target now award a flat rate of experience instead of basing it on the stack count. Stacked bounties are now stripped one at a time when killed instead of removing the entire stack when a player receives three deaths. And players who are currently bountied cannot acquire additional bounties, though that may be adjusted in the future if they want to add in different threat levels. Uh, I would love to see them add in different threat levels, and I think not including that from the get-go is probably not on point. Uh, I mean, I want to see if somebody has a 10 kill streak, they get five bounties. I want to see if they're now on a 25 kill streak that they get another five bounties. And then I want to see if they're on a hundred kill streak or 50 and then a hundred. I want to see you incrementally stack additional bounties on them. And I also want to make the reward you get from killing them even greater. And I want to see their icons show up on the screen even larger. Uh, but that's just my opinion regarding bounties. Next on PTS is the death camera, and I talked a bit, a bit about it, and I watched all the videos of people who are playing around with the death camera, and so far, uh, I'm happy with its implementation. But here is how the death camera works in its current iteration on PTS. So when you are killed, your camera will track and highlight the player that killed you for a brief period before refocusing on your course, uh, your corpse. Uh, the new camera aims to give players a better understanding of where attacks are coming from and help ease frustrations caused by deaths that feel abrupt or unfair. Uh, they want you to report any issues with it because it's a work in progress. The current known issues are the black UI overlay makes the screen look darker than intended. Uh, the red outline appears instantly on death instead of transitioning in. And the red outline sometimes only highlights armor and weapon attachments and not the base character model. Uh, from everything that I saw, it seemed to be working properly that the entire character or the entire vehicle was completely outlined in red. Uh, the black UI didn't look too terrible. 
Uh, but I'm pretty excited about what's going on with the death camera right now uh, and would love to see this come to live after it's been tested properly. Finally, on this PTS, there's a bunch of miscellaneous changes, fixes, and additions. Uh, they fixed the various IFF crosshair issues for NSO characters. Uh, they extended the range at which hard light barriers will appear for distant players. Uh, they pushed out a speculative fi fix for the 000 alert timer bug. Uh, NSO characters should also now be able to access faction-specific jump pads. Uh, the NSXA Kappa minimum damage was reduced from 50 to 42. Destroyed terminals can now be hacked by infiltrators, uh, which is a big change to the game because obviously previously in the game, in order to stop uh, people from spawning at a terminal, you would destroy it. Uh, and then that way when somebody dropped in, they couldn't drop an infiltrator and hack that, so you'd destroy friendly terminals. Making this change is a, a big gameplay change element, so uh, I hope they consider this with more than a grain of salt when making this change to the game itself. Uh, next, the critical chain implant buff no longer lasts indefinitely, and they made a change to new players that they're going to receive 100 certs at each new battle rank through BR100 instead of the first 15. So this is a new reward that every battle rank you're going to get a free 100 certs, which uh, is not terrible at all. So there's your entire PTS update. Uh, obviously, if you're curious about the death camera like I was, you need to download the PTS, get out there and play around with it. Uh, and I would love to see them do a PTS playtest soon with the aerial anomalies again, have on automated bounties on and have the death camera and all that running all at the same time and get some good feedback regarding it. So, uh, Nick, if you're listening, push this next PTS update out ASAP. All right, with that, let's move on to the fourth and final topic this week. And that last topic is about advertising. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but I have certainly noticed it, that there is a lot of Planetside 2 advertising popping up. Uh, Facebook particularly, there's now a NSO video that's out there saying, come play the third faction with a bunch of gameplay video on it. People have been seeing advertisements on Reddit. People have been seeing advertisers, advertising all over the place. Uh, and that makes me happy because I think that the Daybreak Games has not been focusing enough on advertisement regarding Planet Side 2. Uh, so the fact that they're even doing some is good. And this also brings me towards merch as well because I, I've always felt that it's been a uh, something that they've missed regarding merchandise for Planet Side 2. Uh, for someone like me who's attended all the events and things, it's it hasn't been too difficult to get my hands on Planet Side 2 merchandise. Uh, but for other people who are just joining the game who want a Planet Side 2 mouse pad uh, or who want to grab a dog tag or something like that, there's no way for them to get these things. And for the devs to... And maybe this isn't something that the devs need to be working on and more that the marketing department of Daybreak Games need to be working on. Uh, getting more merchandise out into the field for people who play Planet Side 2. Um, you know, what would be an awesome thing is these developer jackets that the original people making Planet Side 2 got. Imagine if you put together something like that for the best mentors in Planet Side 2 and mailed those out to people. Can you imagine the buzz? That would happen from doing something like that for your players or finding a cache of these old mouse pads, which I don't think that Daybreak Games even has anymore. Uh, I mean, when I was there talking with the guys, they said that they didn't have much stuff left uh, for Planet Side 2. But can you imagine sending out mouse pads or other promotional merchandise to people? It would it would just generate so much cool buzz within the game itself. And now maybe Planet Side 2 is too small of a game to do something like this, but they're so focused on community that community is what makes the word of mouth for this game continue to draw new players in and stuff like that. I mean, it's all well and good that each year I get a pretty awesome Christmas gift from these guys and I really guess shouldn't be complaining, um, but offering more merchandise out there 
uh, for players would actually be pretty darn cool. I mean, T-shirts are a huge thing within the gaming community. Uh, just imagine if they started offering the ability to purchase T-shirts through Daybreak Games, and they can easily you know, work with some other company to make low-cost T-shirts that doesn't bring them a ton of money in, but brings them a ton of goodwill within the community. And guys, reach out to me if you need a specific company to go with, and I can direct you in, in any direction that you want uh, for putting together some sort of t-shirt, you know, side t-shirt business for Planet Side 2 to get stuff in the hands of people, you know, ravenous fans of Planet Side like me. Uh, so that's, that's what I really wanted to talk about in this last topic. And maybe this is just me talking, but the fact that they're doing some more advertising for Planet Side 2 makes me think again about merchandise in Planet Side 2 and kind of jump starting the community to really talk about how awesome the devs are for doing this or awesome the devs are for doing that outside of creating the game itself. Just my thoughts. Uh, I'd be curious if anybody else out there has any feelings regarding this. But with that, let's move on to housekeeping and wrap up this week's show. Housekeeping. Housekeeping. Come back later, please. Housekeeping. Not now. Housekeeping. Go away. I coming anyway? So I did get one email this week, and it was from Louie, and he wrote, Hey, Derringer, for the last five months or so, I've been playing the fan-resurrected MMORPG City of Heroes. Uh, as a side note, Louie messaged me and said, Are you playing City of Heroes? And I said, The game from 2005? And he's like, Yeah, it's back. And I said, No, I'm not. So <laughs> I'm glad Louie's enjoying this. But... Uh, he goes on to say, I finally logged into Planet Side 2 last week and the itch instantly came back. So I've been binging the Instant Action podcast to catch up on all the news and game changes. The thing I was most excited for was the Thumper. You're right about it being an assist machine, and I've been trying my hardest to get straight kills with it. It's not easy. I think the incendiary ammo should have been green plasma like in Planet Side 1, but oh well, I guess. Another thing I miss is the option to bounce your grenade, a feature that would make this weapon way more fun. Uh, speaking towards this, Louis, I agree. The plasma should have been green. And yes, the grenade should be able to bounce at least once before they hit their target. Uh, he goes on to say, the other new thing that stuck out with me was the sanctuary. Erebus had the exact thoughts I did, making it a hub for everything planet side. You can go there to choose to go to different servers, go play Arena, hop on PTS, and next year's new game, quote-unquote Planet Side Louie, that will have Call of Duty Overwatch-type matches in it. Sanctuary will help keep your account characters all in one spot. Your characters wouldn't necessarily share levels between game types, but maybe it would help with a reward system where you earn rewards cosmetics across the account by playing each game. Maybe this is their chance to take another crack at a game as at in-game ads as well. It's called drifting. Uh, thanks for helping me catch up with the game, Louie. Uh, Louie, you're absolutely right on that Sanctuary stuff. I don't know about Planet Side Louie, though, but using Sanctuary as a locale to play all the different types of games, Planet Side 2, Planet Side Arena, uh, competitive stuff in Planet Side 2, th there's a real chance that Sanctuary could work out some as something really good like that. Uh, I mean, it would be awesome if you could use your existing character in Planet Side 2 in Planet Side Arena. Uh, that would be something very interesting. Uh, but again, Louis, thanks for the email. But that's going to be it for this week's show. So how can you get in touch with me the show itself? First, visit my website, www.instantactionpodcast.com. Email me like Louie did, and I'll read it on the show and comment on it, instantactionshow at gmail.com. You can call me and leave me a voicemail at 347-4VM-4PS2. Those digits are 347-486-4772. And finally, please follow the show on Twitter at InstactPodcast. But in closing, if you've enjoyed the show, please leave me a review on your podcast listening avenue of choice, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere else. Also, feel free to tell your friends and outfit mates about the show. But finally, thanks for listening and keep spamming that join combat, formerly known as Instant Action Button. Derringer out.
Get your arms combined. 